For more on this story, I want to bring in James Mercanti. He is the president of the New York Board of Pilot Commissioners. This is a state agency responsible for licensing and regulating boat pilots. He's also a maritime attorney. Thank you for being with us, James. Yeah, good morning, Chanel. Nice to be here. So we can now report, James, the ship lost propulsion before the bridge collapsed. Talk to us about what that really means and how a pilot might be trained to react to something like that. Well, what, what's going to depend is if when you say loss of propulsion, whether it lost steering and power. If it lost steering and power, then basically it's a dead ship uh, just being carried by the current or its own, own momentum. Uh, I thought it was very interesting that at the, at the last second prior to the impact, you did see a big, big puff of black, real dark black smoke, mm -hmm. which, which, which could indicate, uh, Chanel, that uh, either power was restored at the last minute and the pilot was attempting to uh, make an emergency maneuver either by going full astern or by making a hard uh, hard left turn uh you know and, and so that that's going to be very interesting to determine whether or not uh they lost power and steering uh or um, and whether or not that was restored because uh, uh, we see that we see a lot of loss of propulsions here in New York Harbor and the crew is usually fighting uh, feverishly uh, in the engine room to restore that power because without that propulsion, you're basically uh, uh, you're just being trying to maintain bare steerage way. And in a narrow you know channel like this, uh, where you could run aground on one side, hit a bridge on the other side, uh, your options are, are very limited. Uh, so uh, that's my observation of what I've seen so far. So, James, based on what we know and just given the speed and the size of this vessel, was there any other way this could have panned out? Uh, well, one thing that the pilots and the captains are trained to do in a, in a situation like this is, is to drop anchor. Mm. Uh, the ship has two, the two very huge anchors. Uh, the problem is that if you have momentum going forward and you can't go in reverse and you drop your anchors, you can end up running over your own your own anchor. Now you eventually may stop, but you got to remember this is a this ship is three football fields long. It's over 900 feet long, and someone reported it was going about eight knots. Now eight knots is not a big speed in in an, in an open area like that, but um, uh, it, it it would take quite a while. Uh, probably the length of you know five six football fields. To bring that ship to a stop, even after dropping the anchors, because of its, if its power and momentum. And this is a behemoth. This is three football fields long. So, but typically, that's the only recourse that the pilots or the captains have is to drop their anchors. And I imagine if they didn't do that here, we don't know. We haven't heard any reports on that. There'd be a good reason uh, that they fig figured that 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 wouldn't wouldn't have uh, stopped the incident from happening. Plus, when you drop an anchor, usually the ship will start swinging. Uh, on its anchor, and instead of the bow hitting the bridge, you could have had the the stern of the ship hitting the bridge. So uh, there was really once they did a May Day, and obviously the May Day is a big big deal because if the pilots radioed a May Day, then there was a big mechanical failure, either loss of propulsion, steering, or both. And James, I don't know if we have the answer to this question, but I'll ask it anyway. Just given where we saw the ship had that moment where the lights were flickering and then where we saw that it actually hit the column and the bridge came down. In your assessment and in your, in your experience, would there have been time to put that anchor down? You know, it, it, and that would depend whether there was crew on the bow, right? Because the anchor was on the bow and that and typically when ships get underway like this from a port, there's, there's, there is a bow watch person and the, and, and the NTSB, the Coast Guard will be looking at that. Was there someone on the bow? Was there crew on lookout? And if there is an emergency, they should be ready to deploy their anchors uh, in, in a second's notice. I mean, the, 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 the pilot or the captain radios the bridge, uh, excuse me, radios the bow. The crew member on the bow has his radio. They say drop anchor, and they would drop anchor. So that's going to be interesting to see uh, if that was looked at. And it's also it should be noted that you know, these ships have the the functional equivalent of a black box. And I haven't heard anyone talk about that yet, but all these ships, uh, these modern day ships have what they call a VDR, a uh, voyage data recorder. So everything that went on in that bridge, it verbally is recorded. And that of course will be studied very, very carefully. So they'll ha have to determine, well, when, when in the voyage, for example, 
did the ship experience a, a malfunction, whether it was power or, or steering? And that'll be determined because the Voyage data recorder has a, has a, t a time on it. So it'll be, it'll be second by second by second. So they'll know exactly when the May, May Day was radioed. They'll know exactly when the ship lost uh, power or propulsion by, by, by what was going on on the bridge. And look, these pilots are very, very well-trained, very skilled pilots. They've probably done this voyage thousands of times. It's not a challenging uh, voyage. So what makes it challenging is what happened uh, on, the, on the ship. Uh, and, and as far as, you know, you, otherwise uh, maneuvering under that bridge, even at night, is, 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 a, is a piece of cake for, for these skilled uh, Maryland pilots. And James, we know that you're also a maritime attorney, so I do want to ask you about what the liability in this might look like. Well, uh, it, it, it's, it's going to be one heck of a case, and it's going to take a lot of attorneys for a lot of years to sort through all, all this with the uh, not only the damage to the bridge, the damage to the ship, the, the casualties. There'll be, there'll be fatality claims. There'll be injury claims. There'll be you know, business interruption claims for the, 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 the bridge collapsing, the people that have to get to and from work, uh, the, the, the fact that commerce is stopping. No ships are going in. No ships are going out. There's going to be a major salvage operation where they have to uh, remove the the remnants of the bridge is going to be a wreck removal, a salvage, and that's going to take weeks. And meanwhile, you have, you, you may have a cruise ship in there, or a cruise ship that was on their way in, and you know you're going to have so, so many charter party disputes as to you know that you know, it could be perishable cargo, uh, cargo delays. So the, the 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 litigation, the maritime litigation here is going to be a textbook, like law school type case, and there's going to be major implications. And obviously, that's where. You know, these big ships have major insurance behind them, and uh, hopefully enough. <laughs> we'll see. Okay, James Mercanti, thank you. Thank you.